é um engenheiro, um engenheiro da Microsoft em Redmond. Uh, trabalha na Microsoft desde 92. Uh, Vem-nos contar algumas das pequenas histórias que aconteceram ao longo do, do seu percurso na, na Microsoft. Algumas que se passaram com eles, outras que foram em segunda mão, digamos assim. Uh, à medida que quiserem, podem ir fazendo perguntas. Temos aqui o um microfone para ir passando pela assistência. Portanto, uh, pronto, esperamos que gostem e vamos dar início à sessão. Thank you. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. No. Oh, wait. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'll use this thing. All right. Can you hear me okay? Louder? Quieter? Louder. Is that better? Okay, good. So, put it over like this. Oh, I just took the thing off. I am destroying your equipment. Yeah. Is this okay? Louder. 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 Quieter. <laughs> this is so complicated. Okay, I think this is good. Okay, I didn't bring any slides because I learned that, uh, well, one, if you bring slides, um, there was a conference I went to back in the, back when I worked on the DirectX team and the direct draw people had, uh, were working on uh, execute buffers or no, it was some other drawing primitive. And one of the things that you passed to this drawing primitive was a, a, a data structure called a vertex buffer. And through all of the slides, they called them, they referred to them as VB for vertex buffer to save time. Um, but then when the conference began and they put their slides up, all of the letters VB got changed to Microsoft Visual Basic because uh, they submitted the slides and then the marketing team went through and fixed all of the problems with the slides. <laughs> and so throughout the entire conference, they were telling you how to use DirectDraw with Microsoft Visual Basic. Um, so I've learned don't do slides. Um, but uh, so, let's see. Uh, I don't know, I just have a collection of stories. Uh, I have sort of like a list of titles and things that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is, so for example, I'll, I'll start with some stories about how, about, uh, you know, funny things that happened during uh, our projects. Uh, there was one project that we were doing and there was a, um, there was of course a, a weekly meeting where all of the groups got together and discussed their, their project status and so the managers could see how things were going. And, and there was one group who was, uh, every, every week they reported better, you know, in the, their status kept getting better. They said one week they said they were about 10% done, next week about 20%, 30%. It, it kept going up and up every week. And then uh, at, at one of the meetings, you know, it was their turn to report on how things were going. And they said, yeah, we're, we're about 80% uh, done. It almost links now. Um, so, Everybody else in the group sort of went, oh, well, then what were they doing? Um, fortunately, so everybody had to adjust. The, the management was sort of kind of upset by this. And uh, this schedule got adjusted. But fortunately, this was a group that was, that was there were no other groups dependent upon this group. So they, they got to mess up in their own quiet way. Um, there was, uh, on a lot of times, customers, you know, uh, you know other other software companies who are having trouble doing their programming will come and contact uh, the customer support or the developer support teams and then they in turn contact the programmers where we can help give them advice. Um, and there was one customer who came in and I was asked to help them out because they had some, they, they, had, they had written up their code but it was, it was crashing in places and it was hanging in other places and other places it wasn't really giving the right answer and I was looking at it and and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, wait a second, the, the, what you're doing is just completely confused. The, the, the performance will never be good. It will always, it will never work the way you want. This perform, the performance will be terrible. Why are you doing this? And the, 
customer liaison, which is, of course, it's very dangerous to let people like me talk directly to customers. So we always go through, we, we try to go through a customer liaison who can then change what we say from you're stupid to maybe you should try something else. Um, <laughs> But on my website, there's no customer liaison. You get to hear me say, you're stupid. Um, but so I, I, I told the customer liaison that, you know, this is, this is just a bad idea. Why are they doing this? And the liaison got back to me and said, well, see, the, the problem is that this project that they're working on is version two of their software. But it is so far behind schedule that they've been cutting features left and right to try to get back on schedule. And this is their last feature, so they can't cut it. <laughs> so um, don't do that. <laughs> um, there was an, another. There was a project that uh, a colleague of mine worked on. Uh, he at one point he was a product tester, and uh, this was a product that, of course, is now it's rather popular to have your you know your program, and then you can have all these different skins. You can make it look like you know a Pokemon or whatever. Um, and so this is a product that had one of those, you know, customizable look feature things. And, uh, and so, you know, the development team wrote the, wrote the feature and got it all working. And his job was to test it. Um, the, the actual production of the themes was given to an outside company because you don't want to trust programmers to design things that look pretty. Um, <laughs> because otherwise all we'll do is Star Trek. And, um, <laughs> or Lord of the Rings. And tell it, so a couple weeks ago, our group was celebrating, I'll come back to this story. A couple weeks ago, our group was celebrating completion of this uh, intermediate product milestone. And uh, the, the manager of our little group said, okay, well, you know, uh, good job, Every, congratulations everybody. We're gonna go out and do this sort of, uh, you know, uh, relaxate, you know, uh, morale type of, you know, group activity. And we went to a uh, glass making factory, or actually a glass studio where they, they work with glass and make, you know, make, make uh, plates and vases and things. And, um, and so the person who was teaching us, you know, how, what we're going to, because we're going to be hands-on. And at, eventually it got to the point where the, the teacher and the assistant were going to each take, we we're going to break the group up into two. Um, and each of us would work with either the teacher or the assistant to, to make our little little projects, and uh, and the teacher all through all through the all through the instruction, the teacher kept talking about the Lord of the Rings. He kept talking about you know the glass. And he said, oh you know we're going to Mount Doom and throw the ring in, and he was doing all of these Lord of the Ring jokes. And when it came time to split into two groups, he said, okay. Okay, we need to split into two groups. So all the Lord of the Ring fans on this side of the room and all the Star Trek fans on that side of the room. And uh, of course, we're geeks, so we actually moved around to make sure we were on the right side. Um, anyway, so back to this, <laughs> back to this story about the, 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 the theming of this app application. And my friend was the tester for this product. And, uh, and they gave the job of doing all of this work to, the to a design team on the outside. And, uh, and again, you know, the meetings would get together and you know, all the groups would get together and, and the, the ask the, design, the, the, the designers, like, how are, how, are the, how are the themes looking? You know, how are the skins looking? And they would say, oh, you know, it's, 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 it's really tricky. You know, it, it's harder than it looks. And, okay, and next week, how's it looking? Oh, it's... It's really, it's really tough, you know. I mean, this is this is not easy. I mean, you have to get everything to line up right, and it's like, okay. Next week, how's it looking? It's, I mean, you know, it, it's it's taking a while. I mean, this is this is really difficult. And and meanwhile, my friend's job was to test these things, and so they weren't, they hadn't arrived yet. Um, so of course, you know, he he had plenty of other things to do. So he was, you know, writing automation for other features and things. But it, it he started getting kind of concerned. And so. Uh, one day, he's, he says to himself, okay, how hard can this be? So he goes to the developers and says, okay, give me the same documentation that you gave to those people and whatever tools. And then he comes in on, you know, comes into work on Saturday, surfs the internet, grabs a bunch of Star Trek pictures, makes himself a Star Trek skin. You know, you click on it and Picard says hello or something. Or Kirk, he must have been an old school Star Trek. Um, 
You know, and so, you know, it was, it looked really ugly because, of course, a dork made it. But, but it got the idea across, and he could test with it, right? He could put this in. So you, now, you have, now this program has two skins, the regular skin and the Star Trek skin. And then at the next status meeting, we all, you know, everybody got together, and they asked the designers, so how's it coming? And they said, well, you know, it's really hard. This is really hard work. It's, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds. And my friend says, oh, well, maybe I can help you here. Let me show you. And he opens it up, opens up his, uh, his well, no laptops back in these days, but... He, you know, hook connects to his, brings in his computer, calls it up, and says, oh, see, you know, here, Star Trek. Do, 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 do. And everybody was like, oh, okay. Next week. Hey, how are those skins coming? Oh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> so there's no moral to that story. <laughs> Most of my stories don't have morals. They're just stories. I'm sorry. If you expected to learn anything here, you will be sorely disappointed. Um, back when the Windows NT project was starting, there was, um, you know, Windows NT. There were a lot of, you know, groups with that that, that made it up, and. Uh, and it's sort of natural when you take a bunch of groups that used to be working independently and put them together is that there's friction and they don't trust each other. Um, you know, the other people are always cool. You know, the other, it's like we're, we're much smarter than those other guys over there in the you know, user interface group. They're a bunch of idiots. They can't even match their socks. Um, but, uh, and so the, the, the management for the project decided that the, the way to sort of smooth these differences is to bring everybody together once a week in the cafeteria um, and just like have just like basically just have a social get together um, serve some snacks give them beer let them drink tell stories and uh, and this actually worked um, you know because once you get drunk with somebody I don't know um, no but uh, you know then after you know you if it's it's if there's somebody you've never actually met, but you've only, you know, read email or, you know, that sort of thing, then it's, it's, it's much easier to, to, to not think of them as a person. But if you meet them every week, then it's much easier to sort of relate to them. And then the, the situation goes much more smoothly. Um, and these meetings were originally called Windows Integration Meetings because it was about um, integrating, bringing different groups together to get them to work together. Um, now they're called, I think they're called Windows Informational Meetings um, because I guess it was harder to explain to the upper management why you were spending so much money on beer. Um, so it's like, no, no, we bring them together and we give them like uh, information about how the project is going. It's like, okay, we can do that. Um, now when I tell this story, there are some people who are concerned about how much I talk about beer. Um, now while it is true that you know, at, at, a, at a lot of you know, informal Microsoft functions there will be beer made available, but there is no actual requirement that you drink the beer. Um, there are many people who don't drink. I don't drink, but you know, and so you know, nobody's forcing you to drink. Nobody looks at you funny if you're not drinking beer. Nobody really cares. And in fact, if you don't drink, it's a lot easier because then the line is shorter. Um, there was, there was, uh, there was. I remember there was another integration between two groups that didn't go quite as well. There was, uh, there were two projects that were doing roughly this. Well, there were two projects that originally were doing different things, but then as the projects evolved, they started moving closer and closer together, and they ended up solving about roughly the same problem. And so the manager who was in charge of both of these projects said, you know, okay, this is getting kind of silly. We have two, two teams doing the same thing. We need, to, we need to do something about this. And one of the groups assumed that the, the manager in charge was saying, we're going to cancel one of your projects. And so they went into full on, you know, full court press, crazy basketball, you know, full attack mode. They like wrote all of these long documents explaining, well, their design is much better than the other design, and the, the their design is much more, uh, you know, forward looking, and the old design is 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 stuck in the past, and and we are much prettier than those people, and all, you know, all just just you know, really playing hardball to to destroy the other team. But in fact, that's not what the manager was trying to do. His, he said, well, now that these projects have, have basically solved the same problem, we'll, we'll combine them into one project. Um, his idea, his plan was not to destroy one of the teams, but rather to merge them. Um, 
and as a res and uh, so the people on the first team were kind of um, they didn't look so good after they wrote all of those documents talking about how much more awesome they were than the other people and how the other people sucked. Um, so another okay, so there's a lesson there. Don't assume the worst. No, wait, that's not a lesson. Your lesson is play friendly. There we go. Um, anyway, uh, let me see. I have some Windows 95 stories here. Um, this is stories from a time when probably uh, like the idea of a machine with eight megabytes of memory was like, holy cow, what are you ever going to do with all of that? Um, it's true, eight meg, it was just crazy. Um, oops. <laughs> Quality workmanship. Um, so if, if you went, I, I, I've told this story before, if you go digging through the Windows 95 uh, or the Windows 3.1 and therefore Windows 95 libraries, you'll see functions called like tab the text out for wimps. And uh, what's the other one? Oh, bozos live here. Um, that, now the thing, this, the story behind this is those were not the original names of the functions. The functions actually had more boring names. But what happened was that back in the Windows, Windows 3.0, Windows 3.1 era, um, it became very common for software vendors to, to reverse engineer parts of Windows and this was a leftover. These functions were exported as functions from the user interface library, not because we actually wanted people to call them, but because various technical limitations required them to be made available. Um, and they weren't, they weren't necessary anymore, but they were still made available because these applications were still using them. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Uh, <laughs> if you, if we uh, can do some program to the, um, the farmers and to the, um, their their cows, their sheep, however, um, and make it um, free because they don't know they need it. They just need it if it is free. How we do that? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll do general questions and answers, the question and answer later. How about that? Okay. okay. All right. Um, okay. Anyway, so these... Discuss. No. Uh, where were we? We had these functions that were exported. And they used to be exported for a technical reason, but they weren't anymore. And applications sort of got used to it. There were some applications that decided they were going to call them anyway. Um, with Windows 95, everything got switched over to the, well, you know, switched over to the 32-bit model. And uh, these programs, you know, these older 16-bit programs were still calling these, these entry points that were never meant to be called. And so the question is, what do you do with these things? Because if you just give up on them, then these programs stop working. And so what we did was we, we basically had to implement these functions that you weren't supposed to call anyway. Um, so what happened would be a 16-bit program would call this old function that we were trying to get rid of. Um, and we actually had to write code that took that function and converted it to the 32-bit version of this thing you shouldn't be doing and then calling it, and then taking the answer and then converting it back to a 16-bit version and giving it to the application. So we actually had to write a 16-bit version of a function that you shouldn't be calling that translated it to a 32-bit version of a function you shouldn't be calling. Um, this is the sort of crazy things you have to do when you're an operating system and people have applications that they need to run. And when they upgrade to the next version of Windows, if it doesn't work, they blame you. And if they blame you, then you have to fix it. It's really that simple. Um, a year or two ago, I think it was PC World had put up a list of the 10 worst, what was it, the 10 worst, the 10 worst PCs ever made. Um, and I was looking through this list, and it turns out I actually used the top two. <laughs> um, the number two worst PC ever was the Mattel Barbie PC. This was a computer that was all in pink, had flowers, and uh, 
at you know it was all had all of your Barbie things on it, and I guess it was targeting ten year old eight year old girls or something um, but Microsoft actually bought one of those <laughs> gave it to one of the testers because of course it 's a computer people can buy it we have to make sure it works um, and so it, it went to it went to one of the testers and uh, and, uh, and she decided that, okay, this is silly. I may as well just embrace it. And so she very carefully followed all the instructions and took all of the stickers and put them exactly where they were supposed to go on the computer, plugged in all of the, you know, the, the Barbie quick digital camera, made sure that worked. Um, and uh, and it, was very, it was always very interesting because whenever, whenever there, that computer encountered a problem and then she would call, uh, you know, report the problem, the developers would come in to look at it. And they'd, they'd walk into the oven and they'd walk into the office and they'd say, where is it? And she'd go, oh, it's that one over there. And they'd go. <laughs> um, then they had to fix it. Uh, I'm, I'm told that uh, one summer, the, uh, the college interns came into the office and uh, since uh, the tester didn't need that computer for a while, so they took it. Um, and set it up in the hallway and installed Windows Data Center Server on it. So you have Windows Data Center Server running on a bright pink PC with flowers. Um, the number one computer on the 10 worst computers list was from a company that is no, no longer exists called Packard Bell. And the, back in Windows 95, the senior vice president who was in charge of the division that was doing Windows 95 bought one of these. Uh, for his for home use, and as you know, as, as we're developing Windows 95 and varied beta releases go out or inter, you know weekly builds come out, and uh, every week he would take a CD home and install it on his machine, and then something strange would happen because these machine these so here's an example of how wonderful these machines were when you got the machine and you opened the case, there were no expansion slots all of the expansion slots were already filled up with other stuff. So, I, but the idea here is that, of course, their machine was perfect, and you don't need to upgrade a perfect machine. So, um, this made it very difficult to, for example, install a network card, because there was nowhere to put it. Um, but, uh, anyway, so, the senior vice president would bring CDs home, install them on, the, on, on his PC at home, They'd run into problems because this computer was a piece of junk. And then he would say, you know, your product sucks, doesn't work on my computer. Then you have to bring the computer in, we would take a look at it, try to figure out what the problem is. You know, it's like, okay, we think we got it working, we send it home again, it works great. You know, repeat every week. Um, the, the development manager for Windows 95 was a very clever man. He, he took an unusually direct approach to solving problems. And in this case, his direct solution to the problem of the vice president's, the senior vice president's, vice president's computer that didn't work was to go to the computer store and buy the same computer and then give it to me. My job was to take every build of Windows 95, install it on that computer, made sure it worked, and then we gave it to the vice president. So I, had to, I actually had the worst computer in the world in my office for several years. Um, and it was my job to make sure that the worst computer in the world kept working. I don't know what that means. <laughs> the, I, I said that the, the, the development manager took a very direct approach to solving problems. There was uh, another time when we wanted to make sure that Windows 95's application compatibility was good. And the way he did that was he took his truck, pickup truck, drove down to the computer store, bought one of every program in the store, took it back, said, hey everybody, I have a truck full of software. It all got to work in Windows 95. So come on down. And people came down and he said, okay, you can come in and you can take whatever you want. We'll start with two, take two. And uh, your job is, after you take the software, is to install it on your computer, make sure it works. If it doesn't work, you know, let the development team know, get them to fix it. And your reward is that once, once the product is complete, you got to keep the software. And 
So, you know, he pulls up his truck, unloads it in the cafe, you know, sets up tables in the cafeteria, software everywhere. It looks like a giant crazy flea market. Um, and then he, the mail goes out, it's like, hey, come on down. So people just come on down, and it really was like a flea market. People are walking around looking, it's like, ooh, ooh that, that looks good. Yeah. He's like, yeah, take this one. It's like, ooh, no, I found a better one. People, you know, waiting in line to check out, saying, oh, what'd you get, what'd you get? It was very strange, but it was very effective. Windows 95, as you know, shipped with very high compatibility. Um, there was, uh, there was the time in, um, during Windows 95, you know, I mentioned that, um, at the, uh, you know, we had the, we had the little event at the glass, at the glass studio. Um, so it's, it's common when, when a major, a major milestone is reached to do a little, you know, celebration. And there was one team who decided that, you know, to celebrate, they'd all go to a very nice restaurant for lunch. And... It was nice. They, you know, they went out. They came back. The uh, the administrative assistant then got a telephone call from the restaurant saying, "Hi, um, you had a group that was in here for lunch. Uh, nobody paid the bill." <laughs> um, so the administrative assistant had to extend a profuse apologies and give them the credit card information so they could pay the bill. Um, this, the thing is that this administrative assistant happened to have a credit card wh uh, whose uh, credit limit at the time was uh, half a million dollars. Um, in today's money, that would be accounting for inflation and, the, and the, the exchange rate would be about half a million euros on one credit card. Um, we were all just very shocked that basically this person could go and buy a house with a credit card. But fortunately, this person was honest and only used it for official business. <laughs> Otherwise, um, we would wonder where all that money went. Um, there was uh, back in the so you know shortly after Windows ninety five released, there was all this excitement, blah blah blah. People were uh, had to, and of course, one of the things that people had to do was to get right drivers for their hardware. When you know Windows ninety five drivers to get their hardware to work better. The old Windows the old drivers still work, but the newer, you know, if you wrote to the new driver model, it would work better. And I remember I was in one of these support rooms where uh, we were discussing writing Windows 95 drivers, and one person asked the question, saying, "Yes, um, so this is back in the day. This is back in the day when device drivers were still written in an assembly language. Um, if you were really cool, you might try writing it in C, but you'd be kind of taking your chances." Um, and uh, so, you know, we're all discussing, you know, assembly language, this, registers, blah. And a person asks the question, yeah, um, so I have Visual Basic. Can, can I write my driver in, video ba in Visual Basic? And I, I sort of said, well, you know, device drivers, they tend to be written in assembly language. Maybe if, you, if you're really clever, you can try using C, but it's kind of tricky. Um, and the person wrote, well, but I have Visual Basic Professional. Uh, does that help? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, but uh, it was, thanks for asking. Um, and there was, uh, so at, at the Windows 95 launch, I don't know how many of you remember that, you know, the big exciting thing with Jay Leno back when he was, no wait, he was famous then too. Okay. Um, back when he was cool. All right. I don't know if he's still cool. He was he was the host for the for the the Windows 95 launch. He was actually the first like big the Windows 95 launch was a very strange event. It was the first like major media event for a software product. Um, like the Windows 3.1, the Windows 3.1 launch, it launched at a conference in Chicago. There was no celebrity. You know, it was the manager there saying, "Hey, check out our new product." But we had Jay Leno. Ooh. Um, and at the end of the event, you know, all the media were there. And, uh, and you got a commemorative edition. It, it was a box that said Windows 95, special edition. And, uh, you know, you got other, you know, you got a nice tote bag and stuff. But, in, you know, you got a box of Windows 95 that said Windows 95, special edition. We were all wondering what's so special about it. We asked around. Turns out what is special about Windows 95 special edition is that it comes in a special box. <laughs> That's all. Oh, well, we'll, 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 we'll do questions later. Um, 
So one of the things one of the things that we had to do when we were developing Windows 95 is that when we would find a problem with a piece of software, we would have to call the company and tell them, hey, we found this problem. Um, you know, just letting you know. And we would, we would call up the company and say, hey, we found this problem with, this problem with your program. But, uh, but we added a fix in Windows 95 so your program still works. And they'd say, oh, thanks. And they'd hang up. And then we'd call them back and say, hi, yeah, remember me? I was just talking to you. Um, we uh, you didn't let me finish. Um, we, we're, we're making the next version of Windows. We found a problem with your program. We made a change to Windows 95 so your program still works. And they'd say, oh, that's great. You guys are awesome. Thanks a lot. It's like, no, no, no. Okay, hang on. Um, we made the change to the Windows 95 so your program still works, but your next version won't. All of a sudden, they were interested. Um, it was, it, it was, but at least they were interested. There were other companies that I would like, is me, pers me specifically, um, this is particularly common in video games. The video game industry, or the computer game industry is very strange. Um, computer games, when you make your computer game, most companies, they make it, they sell it, after about three months, that's it, it's gone. They make all their money in three months and then it's over. Uh, so I would call these companies saying, hi, yeah, um, I'm on the Windows 95 team, compatibility, we're running your program, we found some problems, you know, can you, we can't quite understand what's wrong, can you, can you put us in touch with somebody who can, uh, can help us out? And they would say, oh, we don't care. <laughs> He's like, which, pro which game was this? Uh, it was, you know, such and such game. Oh yeah, that game's like two years old. Don't buy it. <laughs> we don't care. He's like, but, but then how will people, you know, will we really want people to be able to play your game? And they pay good money for it. And, and they still, presumably, after they upgrade to Windows 95, the game should still like, oh, well, here, let me help you make a boot disk. Um, so they'd, and I'd be like, okay, thank you. So it was very difficult to get game companies to actually help us with making Windows, making their programs work under Windows 95. They usually didn't care at all, um, which is more frustrating for me than for the game vendor. Um, there was uh, there's a story about uh, DirectX. DirectX has uh, the device driver interface. Um, there's a capabilities query. We can ask the, you can ask the driver, it's like, do you support this video card feature? Do you support that video card feature? And there was one video card driver, we would you know, install it, and we would try using some video card feature, and it just simply wouldn't work. And so we called the manufacturer and said, hey, do you, do you support this feature? And they said, no. And I said, but when we ask your driver if it supports the feature, it says yes. And they said, what was that feature again? It was this such and such. Never heard of it. <laughs> we then took a look at they we then took a look at their driver. It turns out their driver basically, um, when you asked it, do you support this feature? Always said yes. <laughs> because man, their driver was awesome. <laughs> um, the, 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 the manager, the development manager for DirectX actually solved this problem. What he did was he took, so the, the capabilities query was done by, uh, each capability was specified by a, a GUID. Um, and so what he did was he went into his office and took a network card, read the, the network address off of it because uh, one of the uh, format, GUID formats is a timestamp plus a, uh, a network card ID. So he read the network card ID off it. Then he took a hammer and destroyed the card. Then any time we loaded a driver, we generated a GUID based on that destroyed network card and a randomly generated time. And we said, hey, driver, do you support this? And if the driver said yes, then we said, you're lying. And then we didn't trust anything the driver said ever again. Um, this got the vendor's attention. Um, there are a whole bunch of weird things that happen when you have to deal with hardware. There was. Um, Back in Windows 95, you notice most of my stories are about Windows 95. Why is that? Um, you know, uh, Windows 95 was the first version of Windows to support plug and play, and there were a lot of devices that were not plug and play compatible. And so these huge, you know, files that described uh, how to recognize different types of hardware. And there was one uh, company, I think it was a CD company, made, they made CD drives, CD, you know, you know what I mean. Um, and they were upset because they were looking through these description files and they found that not only was their company name spelled wrong, but it was spelled wrong in a way that made it similar to a rude word. 
And so they considered this a very serious insult. And so they wrote an angry letter saying, you know, how dare you insult us? We have such a great relationship with Microsoft and you're endangering it by insulting us in your information files, blah, blah, blah. And of course, this is a very serious charge. So this was filtered down and uh, somebody who actually understood how to read these files was looking to figure out exactly how this word got in there. You know, was looking through the history, the source code history. And they trace it back and it turns out, oh, the reason why this company name is spelled wrong in the information file is that if you actually go and buy one of these drives and plug it in and send it the identification command, it sends back a misspelled company name. And so we had to put the misspelled company name in the information file so that way we knew what drive it was. Um, but of course, the, the name that's shown to the user is the correct name. It's just that the name on the drive is incorrect. Uh, we, we provided this information back to the company and they never wrote back. Um, there are all sorts of crazy, for some reason CD-ROMs always have these problems. There was another CD-ROM that, uh, it was a, so this was back in the day before CD-ROMs were really that well standardized. And there was one of them that had a custom I.O. controller. And this I.O. controller could control up to four CD-ROM drives. But they decided to save some money when they made it. And so they, it ignored, in the packet, when you, when you had sent a packet to this card, you sent it a command and you told it which of the four CD-ROM drives you wanted this command sent to. But this particular card decided that it would just send all the commands to drive one. So Windows 95 would start up, it would say, hey, uh, drive one, are you there? And drive one would say, yes, I am here. Then it would say, hey, drive two, are you there? And drive one would say, yes, I am here. <laughs> but drive three, are you there? Drive one would say, yes, why are you bothering me? <laughs> drive four, yes, come on, don't you get it? So when you actually installed Windows 95 with this, this particular card, uh, you got four CD-ROM drives, even though they were really just one. And no matter what you did, they all did the same thing. But at least you can fix that. You can, you can go into Device Manager and disable the extra ones. But uh, there was another CD-ROM drive that was even weirder. It, it decided that it would try to, it would, it would, it would support a TAPI, this new interface. Um, and they did, a really, I mean, they did a really great job. They implemented all the commands, they implemented a good chunk of the optional commands, the optimizations. They missed one. The command they forgot to implement is the are you in a TAPI drive command. <laughs> um, so this made it generally not that useful after all. Um, there was a, then there was a sound card. Oh, an, another thing that you learn when you, learn it, when you work at Microsoft is somebody comes to your office and gives you a gift, be very suspicious. I was sitting in my office, minding my own business, and a colleague of mine comes in and says, hey, you want a sound card? I didn't have a sound card in my machine at the time, so I said, sure, I'll have a sound card. And he gives me the card, and I'm sure he smiled and chuckled to himself as he ran away from the room. Because in fact, the problem with this sound card is if you plug the sound card in, the driver crashed all the time. Um, but of course, now he gave it to me, so I had to figure out what was wrong. Um, and I did figure out what was wrong, and we contacted the, the company that made the driver, saying, oh, you know, we found a problem with your driver, here's the fix. We added a workaround to Windows 95 to, to address your problem, but the next version of your driver, you're going to have to fix it. And they said, thanks, that's great. Uh, you know, Windows 95 Beta 2 comes out, comes out, and the company sends us uh, updated drivers to put on the CD. They send us the drivers. I say, that's great. I try it out. I put it on. Crashes exactly the same place. They upgraded the driver. They didn't fix the bug. So we had to adjust it a little more and tell them, like, okay, now next time, this time we mean it. And the next version won't work because, in fact, this version didn't work either. Actually, I think I just told them, I just, yeah. What we actually did is we just simply rejected their driver. We just said, no, we won't ship this driver. We're going to ship the one that works. Um, but uh, so another type of hardware thing that people that people do. So you know, there's uh, when, you know when you buy a computer in the store, actually you know buy it from Dell or something. It comes with all this pre-installed software, and these are you know software that Dell negotiate a special deal, special rate. Um, and so to make sure that you don't like take this copy of you know Works or Microsoft Money or QuickBooks or whatever it is and just install it on all your other computers, you know, use the recovery disk and install it. The setup program, you know, checks to make sure that it really is running on a Dell computer. And they typically do this by going in and hunting around the BIOS looking for, you know, copyright strings and stuff. 
Um, which is why if you look at some cheap knockoff PCs and you go through the BIOS, you might see the phrase not copyright Dell. Because they just take the copyright Dell and then they stick the word not in front. So the search still works. Um, but there was, you got to do it. Um, if, if, if you're going to steal somebody else's software, you got to be clever. Um, when Windows XP did a little bit of this. There was uh, a colleague of mine who worked on setup. And after talking to all of the, the people who had needed space on the CD, you know, the trans space for translation, space for ex additional drivers, service pack space, there was about 30 megabytes of extra space on the CD. And this was back in the days before broadband and stuff. So everybody was still doing things by dial-up. And so he figured, OK, fine. Um, we can just put some 30 megabytes of you know, random garbage on, in that extra space. And setup can just check that that garbage is still there on the CD. The idea is that this will slow down the, the software pirates by about five minutes. Um, I don't know. Anyway, but the point was that he's like, OK, well, uh, I need to come up with 30 megabytes of random data. Where am I going to get 30 megabytes of random data? Now, the easy way, of course, would be to write a program that called RAND for a long time and just wrote it out to memory. But there's no fun in that. So what he did instead is he went around, looked around the internal Microsoft servers, found the archives, and found Microsoft Bob. Now, I don't know how many of you remember. Raise your hand if you've heard of Microsoft Bob. Microsoft Bob was this software that came out in about 1994. It was supposed to be a cute, friendly, easy-to-use version of Windows. Um, it was a total disaster. Um, but there was a copy of it out on the servers, because after all, it's a Microsoft product. You can go get it. And he took a look, and he's like, oh, OK. Um, he got copies of all the Microsoft Bob, C uh, well, floppies back in these days. It came on floppies. And he you know, uh, appended them all after, one after the other, did it repeatedly until he had about 30 megabytes. But that's still not good enough, because of course, you know, 30 megabytes of disk images is really not that random. And so he sent it through, uh, and uh, he just encrypted it, because the output of encryption is more random looking. Um, so he just said, OK, encrypt this file. And it says, OK, what, what password do you want to use to encrypt this file? And he went, <laughs> all right, enter. And he waited, and he's like, OK, your file's encrypted. And he said, thanks, and he put it on the CD. So Windows XP has, in fact, become the most effective way of distributing Microsoft Bob. Every, cop, every, every Windows XP CD has a copy of Microsoft Bob on it. Now, mind you, it's encrypted. So what you have to do is, if you want to be able to install it, is to take your Windows XP CD, find, find the, the extra data, and then cover your eyes and hit the keyboard in exactly the same way as my friend did. Um, and if you get it right, you will know, because then uh, a copy of Microsoft Bob will show up with a stupid smiley face. Um, You know, sometimes the story behind how things happen is very stupid. <laughs> um, so Dr. Watson is now known as, well, Windows Error Reporting, which is when, you know, when a program crashes and it sends information about the crash back to Microsoft so it can be studied and classified. And maybe uh, if, if a fix is known for this, it will send you information about it saying, oh, click here. You can install the, the fix for it. or oh, this is a known problem in this particular company software. You can go you know, download an update from them. Uh, companies can sign up to receive these crashes as well so they can debug their own problems. Um, back, in, back in the day, the original version of Dr. Watson, it was actually called Sherlock, named after Sherlock Holmes because his job was to investigate things. But then, of course, there are copyright problems with that. So it changed. So it was Sherlock with a pipe because you know, he was famous for smoking that pipe. So then the name changed to Dr. Watson, and the icon changed to, um, to a, a, medic, a medi, uh, doctor's bag with a little uh, red cross on it. But then the Red Cross organization got upset that we were using their logo. So now the logo for Dr. Watson is uh, a doctor listening on a stethoscope. Um, oh, that's right. No, the reason why it was renamed from Sherlock is that at the same time, there was another company that made a debugger called Sherlock. And so there was a, a trademark problem. So we had to change the name to Dr. Watson. Um, now, 
I've, I've seen reports that say that like half of all Windows crashes are caused by malware, viruses, Trojan horses, that sort of thing. And I really didn't, wasn't sure if I believed that number, but then a friend of mine showed me some of the actual crash numbers. Um, Windows Explorer, looking at the, the crash information from Windows Explorer, the number one, so I don't know what units these are in, so these are just, you just want to look at the relative numbers. The number one crash for Windows Explorer is a virus. It is, it has a frequency of six million. I don't know if that's crashes per year or whatever, I don't know, but it's just six million. Number two is another virus um, with about, with, and its frequency is 5.5 million. Number three is another virus at 4.5 million. There's a tie for fourth place, two viruses. Um, and then fifth place, another virus. Sixth place, another virus. Seventh place, an actual bug in Explorer at 50,000. So from 6 million, 5 million, 4.5 million, 4 million, seventh place, the first actual bug in Explorer is at 50,000. Um, what's particularly interesting, so, so at least for Explorer, it's, not, it, it's hardly the case that half of the crashes are caused by, by viruses and malware. In fact, it seems most of them are. Um, part of that, of course, is that Explorer is a very welcome or a very enticing target for viruses because it's always running and you can count on yourself being there. Um, the, the antivirus people tell me that, uh, in fact, some of the viruses, one of the viruses that actually I think takes two, two of the top slots because they have multiple versions out. You have to upgrade your virus, of course. Um, two of the viruses are actually a very clever money-making scheme. Actually, they're all clever money-making schemes because why would you do this if you weren't making, trying to make money off of it? Um, this virus propagates and then they, on the side, they also sell an antivirus program that detects this virus and offers to sell you the antivirus program for some money. You pay them money for this antivirus program. It comes in, it says, yes, I cleaned up this virus that I installed. But in fact, it doesn't do anything. The virus is still there, but they don't care because they got their money. Um, and what are you going to do, complain? They're just going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, no speak of the English. Um, <laughs> There was an active X control that did this that was, wasn't quite as nefarious, but it, uh, if you went to a website that used this active X control, it crashed. And the Internet Explorer people went in and you know, put a mark to this guy as saying, oh, this is a dangerous active X control. We probably, or it's, it, it's, it's buggy. We shouldn't run it. And the company called this, you know, contacted the Internet Explorer people and said, hey, um, our thing isn't working anymore. And we said, yeah, that's because it's buggy. It, it crashes in this way and this way and you need to fix it. And they said, no, no, no. We want it to crash. And, and it's like, why, why do you want it to crash? Well, because if it crashes, then people will go and upgrade it and then we make money. Um, what they didn't realize, of course, was that when it crashes and then Windows puts up the, oh, you have a crash in program X, click here to see more, inf more information, it uses Internet Explorer to show you that. Um, Anyway, but so there are some companies that actually want crashes to happen because they use it as a way to force people to upgrade. It's kind of sad. Um, now, there was, um, let's see, I have some stories here about the software development process, I guess. We, in, in our team, there's, uh, this is the user interface team, and so there's this one uh, distribution list, mailing list that everybody belongs to, and the idea is that if you have a problem with the user interface, stuff in Windows, you contact this team. And the responsibility for keeping an eye on this mailing list and making sure that, making sure that every message gets a response um, is rotated among the members of the team so that way it's not like one person who has to sit there all day and deal with this. And the way we keep track of whose turn it is is that we give them a Mickey Mouse hat. Um, there's a schedule that's, that's set up and everybody gets a day. And when it's your day, when you come in in the morning, there's usually a Mickey Mouse hat on your desk. Um, because at the end of the day, the previous person stopped by your office and put it there when he went home. Um, so, one might, and, uh, so one might say that we use a Mickey Mouse system for keeping track of this sort of thing. Um, the Internet Explorer team had a different type of uh, article of clothing that they used. There was, the manager of the Internet Explorer team at the time was famous for wearing really ugly Hawaiian shirts to work. 
Um, and for some reason, and, and and the managers of the, the 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 people in charge of keeping track of how the team was working decided that, you know, we could use one of these shirts as a reward. So what they did is they give they gave they rewarded the person who fixed the most bugs every week with it. They got to have the shirt in their offices as a symbol of how good they were. Um, of course, what they didn't realize is that nobody wants an ugly Hawaiian shirt hanging in their office, um, and so. I don't know exactly how it happened, but at some point, the meaning of the shirt just reversed. It no longer became a symbol of how great you were, but rather became a symbol of how much you sucked. I think probably what happened was like, you know, somebody, the person who had the shirt took it with him and like gave it to somebody else who had like messed up. And so now the, the rule sort of became that if, if you have the shirt, you have the shirt because you messed up. And in order to get rid of the shirt, you have to find somebody else who messed up worse than you did. <laughs> and you have to, then you give them the shirt. And the other person's like, okay, now I have the shirt. And he has to wait for somebody else to make an even worse mistake. And I'm told it took several weeks before the upper management realized that the team was using the shirt in a different way. They would come by and say, oh, there's the nice shirt. And everybody's like, yeah, I got the shirt. <laughs> um, the, Back, back in Windows 95, more Windows 95 stories, PCI was the cool new thing. Um, and, you know, PCI has these, you know, bridge connectors and you can install a crazy tree of hardware devices. And uh, the plug and play team decided that, okay, we need to make sure that we can support PCI when it's pushed to its maximum. So they went out and got a whole bunch of PCI bridge cards and got a computer, opened the case, put one card in plug the next card into the first card, third card, fourth card. They plugged in like 10 cards or whatever the PCI maximum was. By the end of this entire exercise, you had a computer that was over here with the keyboard and the mouse. And at the very end, they plugged in the video card. So at the very end, you had a video card and a cable and a monitor, like at the end of that table over there. And so it took two people to run this computer because one person had to sit and move the mouse and type, and the other person had to watch the monitor and tell them what to do. So you'd be like, okay, is it ready yet? No. Okay, now. Okay, now type your login. Okay, do, do, do. Okay, good. Now move the mouse up. More, more. Left, left. Okay, good. Now the problem, of course, is that since this is such a long chain, it took like several seconds for the screen to update. So you would, in fact, move the mouse, and you have to wait. You go like, hmm. And then it's like, okay, it moved. A little bit more. Uh, Okay, that was too much. Mm. So we didn't do it for very long. Um, but it was enough to prove that at least we got all the, the software part was working. And now if they could just get electrons to move faster, it would be okay. Um, the USB team did a similar thing when, they were, when the USB specification came out. And they, they wanted to make sure that you know, the Windows operating system and all the drivers supported it when you pushed the, PC, uh, the USB specification to the maximum. So they got one of those carts, you know, like, like um, uh, it's, 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 it's a cart, it, it's, it's about yo tall, has two shelves, and they filled it with USB devices. So there was a USB hub connected to another hub with you know, a couple of mice and, and you know, maybe a keyboard and a webcam and some USB lava lamps, I don't know. And, and, uh, you know, and a, they had a USB steering wheel, USB joystick. They like took every imaginable USB device and plugged it into this thing. And at the end, at the end of the day, it, it it all came down to two plugs. There was a power. Oh, there's a USB uh, USB uh, power uh, uninterruptible power supply on there too. So at the end of the day, it came down to two plugs: power and a PC card. A PC card that had USB coming out the side, and the tester would just take this cart, do, 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 do. knock, knock, knock. Hi, hi, I have the USB cart of death. <laughs> That's what they call it, the USB cart of death. And you say, oh, okay. And he's like, uh, so you bring out a laptop, takes the USB cart of death, plugs it in. All of a sudden, the computer goes, do, 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 do. oh, no, I found 63 new devices. Do, 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 do. And then the tester, this is the fun part, the tester would then just wait, 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 and then pull the cart out right in the middle. <laughs> and then it's like, all right, let's see how you do. It's like, oh, it crashed. Oh, too bad. Okay, I'm going to go down the next, next office. Um, you leave you to figure out what happened. 
Um, and so this was this was part of the regular USB testing. Is you just wheel the USB card of death, plug it in, wait a while, unplug it. If the machine stays up, good job. Um, on the subject of like uh, you know random ways of debugging, we had a web internal web page, which was the uh, the magic eight ball. Are you from, how many people know the toy, the magic eight ball? Right. This is a toy where you 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 ask it a yes no question and you shake it and then it gives you the answer. It says like yes or outlook unclear or ask again later. Um, and so I made a web page that was the magic eight ball. So every time you hit refresh, it gave you another strange message like, I think we fixed this bug already. Or, uh, oh, your debugger appears to be not working. Or, um, ooh, looks like a memory failure. Um, but the fun part of this was that each of these messages, there was a secret URL you could use to get each of these messages. And um, it was a lot of fun when somebody submitted a failure report and you know somebody on the team would investigate it and they'd look at it and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Hmm, yeah, okay, this is, we know about this problem and we fixed it in you know, like you know yesterday's build. And they would find the secret URL for the fixed in today's build or fixed in yesterday's build message and say, yeah, magic eight ball says, and then they would send them the URL. So the person would say, oh, I don't know, let me see. And they click it and of course they, the magic eight ball would show up and tell them fixed in yesterday's build and they were like, Huh? <laughs> and then they would say, I don't get it. I see a screen that says fixed in yesterday's build. Yeah, because it's fixed in yesterday's build. <laughs> um, so I don't know. This is, this is one of the projects that you probably haven't heard much about. It's called Red Shark. How many, raise your hand if you've heard of Red Shark. No. Red Shark didn't get much play. It was an internal experimental user interface project. But one of the questions I got, at least from people inside Microsoft, is why is it called Red Shark? And the answer, you'd be surprised, has to do with a Red Shark. Um, the people who were running this project were saying, okay, you know, we have this project, we need to give it a name. And they were sitting in the office of one of the managers who happens to keep all sorts of strange things in his office. And uh, one of the things that he had was an inflatable toy that was a Red Shark. And one guy said, hey, how about that? Like, oh, okay. All right. Red shark. All right, it's red shark. Um, and so they hung this red shark in their hallway so you knew where the red shark team was. Um, okay, so you know, so if you think marketing teams come up with code names, you're wrong. Um, okay, here's... So the DirectX team had a, tried to develop this reputation of being a bunch of crazy people. Um, I know, crazy people at Microsoft. What are the odds? And so all of, their, all of their code names were based on um, weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> but of course, if you actually name your project after a weapon of mass destruction, upper management hears about it and they get kind of upset. So you had to come up with the name of a weapon of mass destruction that you could plausibly claim didn't really mean that. And so the first version of DirectX was called Project Manhattan. <laughs> Not the Manhattan Project, but Project Manhattan, because we really like New York. Um, let's see, if, uh, the, second, the second DirectX project was codenamed Project Orion. I don't know how many people know, any guesses? Orion was a, an ex, uh, a proposal to send rocket ships by exploding nuclear bombs. So you're a rocket ship and you just set off nuclear bombs behind you and the force of the blast pushes you forward. So that was, that was so DirectX 2 was Project Orion. Uh, the thing, this is, okay, Project, DirectX 3 was codenamed Project Orange. Anybody? That was Agent Orange. Um, now we're getting sick. Uh, Project 4 was Mustard. That was mustard gas, World War I. Project 5 was codenamed Diesel. Um, diesel, this is more of a US thing. This was the Oklahoma City terrorist attack, and diesel was one of the fuels used in the bomb. Um, probably doesn't mean as much out here. And number six 
was the last one we were allowed to name ourselves <laughs> because we called it Kool-Aid, which is the, uh, the suicide cult in Guyana a while back. And then at that point, um, they said, forget it. We're not letting you name them anymore. <laughs> and we're like, ah, oh, well, it was fun. Um, so, so much for the DirectX team trying to act like a bunch of crazy people. Actually, I think they successfully convinced management that they were a bunch of crazy people. Um, if you look at the history of DirectX, you may notice that there is no version of DirectX 4. If you look at the versions of DirectX that got shipped, there was DirectX 1, DirectX 2, DirectX 3, DirectX 5. There was no DirectX 4. Um, the reason was that after DirectX 3 was shipped, the management decided that they would have two versions of DirectX coming up next. They would have a, a short, minor version called DirectX 4 and then a bigger version called DirectX 5, and they would work on both of the projects at the same time. But after talking with the, the video game, you know, the video game companies and the video card vendors, it turns out nobody is really interested in DirectX, in the features that were in DirectX 4. So they cancel that project and just put everything in 5. But then the question is, well, what do we do? Do we rename DirectX 5 to DirectX 4? And the management decided that no, we'll just call it 5 and we'll skip 4. Because if you decide that, okay, now it's four, and then you go to a document, and the document says that, you know, blah, 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 we've decided not to pick up this feature for DirectX 4. And then somebody will read this document, they're like, which DirectX 4 are we talking about? Is it before or the after? And then, you know, somebody would say, you said that you weren't putting this version in DirectX 4, but we need this. And it's like, no, that was the old DirectX 4, not the new Direct. never mind. <laughs> there is no DirectX 4, it's all five. It is much easier that way. Um, Let's see. Okay, how, how are we on time? I have no idea. My computer's not working. What time is it? I have 10 minutes to go? I better talk fast. All right, I'm skipping a bunch of stories. Um, we can tell them later. Uh, so, there was a, in, in product support, you know, I, I, I've, I've written about this and Joel Spolsky picked up on it about the trick of, uh, a common problem with uh, product support is that you know that the person like, hasn't turned on the printer, or the printer's not plugged in, or the monitor's not plugged in. You know that the problem is that something's not plugged in. But if you ask them, is it plugged in? They're just going to say, oh, of course. Do I look like an idiot? Of course it's plugged in. And they won't actually check. So the product, the product support people have taught me this trick, is what you tell them is you say, well, sometimes the connection gets kind of weak, and it gets kind of dusty. So could you could go down, crawl under the computer, unplug it, and blow into the plug to get the dust out, and then plug it back in. So these people, they're like, okay, stupid idea. They go downstairs, they, or they you know, crawl under the desk, they unplug it, or they say, oh, it's not plugged in. <laughs> yeah, it works great now. <laughs> um, this trick actually like, works on multiple levels. One is it gives them an excuse you know, I mean, it, it forces them to actually look at the plug. It gives them a way to resolve the problem without looking stupid, right? They have a way of saving face. Because a lot of this is, is, is just, you know, you, you don't want to look stupid. So you just say, oh, no, if I admit that. And he's like, no, I didn't turn it on. He's like, no. You say, turn it off, then turn it back on. And I was like, oh, it was never on. Oh, okay, there we go. Oh, yeah, it works great now, thanks. Um, but the other thing is if you unplug it, then you tell them to blow into it. What do you do? You have to look at it. You blow into it. They're not looking at where they plugged it in. Now, when they plug it back in, they have to pay attention. So this is common, for example, if you plug your mouse into the keyboard port by mistake. They unplug it, they blow. Now, they have to plug the mouse in, and they look more carefully, and they get it right this time. Um, these are just little, little product support tricks. But sometimes the product support team is not good enough at resolving the person's problem. The person gets really, really mad and demands to talk to Bill Gates. <laughs> this actually happens. People call in and they're just not satisfied with the answer and they demand to talk to Bill Gates. And so it's like, okay, well, I'll have you talk to my manager. Talk to my manager. And, and the top level managers actually, if the question gets to the you know, person at the top, you know, top level supervisor, and the person's still really, really mad, wants to talk to Bill Gates, he's like, okay, I'll transfer you. And they transfer. There's actually um, an operator room at product support with some operators, their job is to answer the phone and say, Bill Gates' office. <laughs> I'm sorry, he's in a meeting right now. 
If you give me the information, I'll, I'll have them look into it. So, because, you know, some people just won't give up. Yeah, it's like, okay, you want to talk to Bill Gates? Here you go. Um, there was the, the flight simulator team. There was somebody who uh, reported a problem. So, you know, flight simulator, there are these maps. And, you know, it's very important to get the geography right in flight simulator because that's sort of part of the point. And there was somebody who reported a problem with the map saying that, oh, you have this border between these two countries in the wrong place. And the flight simulator team said, okay, let's take a look. They go back and double check. It's like, no, no, um, thank you for the report, but we believe that we have, the, we have the border in the right place. And the person was not satisfied, and so he just sent email to Bill Gates saying, dear Bill Gates, the border between these two countries is in the wrong place in your flight simulator. Your flight simulator team is not helping me. You need to fix it. Bill Gates, who actually reads his email, takes this message, forwards it to the f head of the flight simulator team, says, look into this. If, you know, you're the head of a project, you have a lot of things to worry about. You do not want to get a piece of email from Bill Gates saying, look into this. <laughs> He's like, okay, Bill Gates said, look into this. We got to look into it, even though we already looked into it. So they went through, they you know, double-checked with their geography people, with the, Microsoft has an entire geography team. Their job is to make sure that all of the terms for bodies of water and islands and things are not, are all, you know, avoid politically charged terms. Um, and uh, so you sent it off to the, to the map people and they double-checked and they're like, yeah, th this, is, this is the internationally recognized border between these two countries. Uh, we have a reference here, you know, this UN map, this treaty. And so they come back and they tell the flight simulator team, it's like, yeah, everything seems fine. Um, we'll uh, give us the customer who is causing the problem. We'll call him and talk to him and figure out maybe he has some other information that we don't. So they call the guy and they like, hey, so we've been looking at, the, at this problem that you reported about the, the border between these two countries. And we're using you know, the 2007 UN map number so and so and so. And it puts the border here. And that's pretty much where flight simulator puts it as far as, we're, as, far as we can tell. Where are we, you know, maybe is, is there maybe using a different version of Flight Simulator or something? Or where, 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 where do you, where, where do you, are you saying the map should be, or the border should be? And you said, oh, the border should be over here on the other side of this mountain or something. And, um, and he said, oh, and which map are you using? Uh, I'm using my shower curtain. I have a world map shower curtain. And, and on that shower curtain, it has the border here. And, and that's not where Flight Simulator puts it. Um, and so they're like, okay, um, th thank you very much. You might want to upgrade your shower curtain. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess we can take questions. Do we have a microphone? Questions? Quem quer fazer perguntas? <laughs> Excuse me. It's again the, the program of the cow, however. <laughs> the one I speak before. I, I didn't quite understand that question. Uh, so, I have someone who uses that program, and he has the Windows Vista, okay? Um, and it is concerned about, um, about, I don't know, some things of Vista. Vista concerns about everything. <laughs> you know, he can do anything, he thinks he can do anything with Vista. Okay. That, that's it. <laughs> okay, so what was the question? The question is what I do. Thank <laughs> you. 
Maybe we'll discuss that later. Um, mais alguma pergunta? <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Enrique. Hi. I have a, a question. You, you said you talked about uh, crappy hardware support mm -hmm. in uh, Windows 95. On, um, well, the problem is on the hardware makers at the, at the time. Uh, I was wondering how is that uh, seen now? Are the hardware makers, uh, do they play nicer or is it the same thing? Um. I, I honestly don't know. I don't. I don't work with. Uh, I, I'm not on the application compatibility team anymore, so I'm really not. I don't have direct information as to how the the situation is handled now. This was part of the reason why most of my stories are about Windows 95. Is that I? It was a much smaller project, and a lot of us had to wear multiple hats. And so I was doing, uh, you know, uh, Windows application compatibility, DOS game compatibility, and even some hardware stuff. Um, you know, I I, I wrote a bunch of Windows 95 drivers. But in Windows in you know now nowadays I'm I'm over in the user interface group and so most of the hardware stuff is just stories I hear from other people. Um, so I'm I'm I actually don't know the answer to your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mazal game? Oi. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Miguel, and I want to, to ask you a question about Internet Explorer. Uh, it's, in fact, the, the only software from Microsoft I use to, to test some application I'm doing. Uh, and I, I find many problems in Internet Explorer related to JavaScript support. And, and my question is, when I analyze those, those problems, I find really basic mistakes on the, the Internet Explorer engine. Uh, I know Microsoft has some very talented people working there. They have some great products, some products not so great, but that happens with all the companies. Uh, my question is, why don't you care more about the Internet Explorer and uh, its compatibility with the, the standards? Because it, an... it causes a lot of headaches to, to web developers. I, I understand that, but I, I, as, as, I, as I recall, the Internet Explorer team, which I'm not a member of, so I'm not really speaking for them, but I, I think there was the, the Mix08 conference where they reaffirmed the, that uh, Internet Explorer 8 was going, to be, was going to use standards compliant mode by default rather than quirks mode. Um, so I'm sure if you run into other standards compliance issues, you can let the Internet Explorer team know and they will hopefully take it under advisement. But uh, that's really not uh, the sort of thing that I work in. So I can just say that you know there, there might be like often, oftentimes uh, there are uh, various you know implementations have to act strange for compatibility reasons. Um, I remember there was a very big uproar when uh, the JavaScript engine or the JScript engine in Internet Explorer was upgraded for uh, year 2000 compliance because it changed the meaning of the get year method. And uh, even though the get year method, I believe, was documented as current year minus 1900, but everybody just, just printed one nine and then the value of get year. And so in the year 2000, they printed the current year is one nine 100. Um, and there was some chain weird thing that happened. I forget whether it was a standards change or whether it was uh, an informal change. It was, but the, uh, the actual meaning of the get year method changed to return the four digit year rather than the offset from 1900. And, uh, and I, 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 I know there were some, there were some websites that, didn't, that were able to take it and others that didn't do so well. And uh, so, you know, changing, changing the behavior of an existing method is always very risky, and uh, even even if the existing method is uh, is not fully standards compliant, there's always a risk in changing it because there may there are often applications that rely on the old behavior. That's this is something that we see a lot of in the uh, in the in the applications compatibility team is that there's you know there's 
uh, a method is documented as saying, you know, this parameter must be zero, and people pass garbage. And whoops, and and you have to come up with a way to, even though these people were doing it wrong, they still have to keep working. Um, but of course, you know, the the internet is a very strange place, and uh, and so trying to because you know a lot of the times. Like with, with, with commercial software, there's a company you can contact and tell them, you know, there's a bug in your program. If it's a website, it could be just, you know, a person sitting in their mom's basement cranking out some J script to run their Dungeons and Dragons game or something. Um, and so contacting them to, to deal with the problem is much more difficult. And you just have to, it, it, it's, it, it's a very difficult balancing act, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, I, but if, if you find an issue, I'm sure you can bring it to the attention of the Internet Explorer team, and they will take a look at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mais alguém tem alguma pergunta? Hello, uh, I have a question about uh, backwards compatibility mm -hmm. because it seems that Microsoft, in every new operating system, always tries to be backwards compatible with all the other ones and all the other older APIs. And uh, I think that tends to generate a lot of uh, overhead on the on the operating system. So when do, you, does, do the developers decide that it's time to stop the backwards compatibility and uh, drop an old API or when do they, when do they decide otherwise? Yeah, that's a that's a very difficult uh, a very difficult decision to decide when to drop support for an old API. The uh, usually that's that's done in consultation with the application compatibility team. They have they have a library of large quantities of software, and they have actually you know they have databases of okay this program calls these three thousand APIs, and so you can run a query saying okay I want to change the behavior of this function or I want to remove that function. You can ask the application compatibility people, um, tell me which programs use this function. And they will come back and they will tell you, okay, these five programs use this function. Or they might say, these 3,000 programs use this function. If it's 3,000, you're going to say, well, then I probably can't do anything about it. If it's these five, then it's like, okay, well, I, I can manage five. Right? I, can, I can change the function and then do a little work to detect these five programs and do something special. Um, the problem is with the programs that aren't in the database. Uh, every corporation has large quantities of um, internally written software. Um, there's a major multinational corporation that still has 916-bit programs that they use on a daily day-to-day -to -day basis. Um, that they, they, I act, there were the, the people who run their IT department came and gave a presentation to, at, at, to our group. And uh, you know, when, when they came up with this number, we, were all, we all gasped in horror. And they said, "Yeah, we actually tried to. We tried to tell all of our divisions around the world that we will not support these 16-bit programs anymore, and they all rebelled. These were all programs that they still used for their regular everyday work, and they were all 16-bit, probably you know Visual Basic 2 or something. Um, and you just and they still needed it. So I mean, this is." This is a problem. Even 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 if the application compatibility team can say there are no Visual Basic two applications out there, we can you know this this function was used only by Visual Basic two programs. We can get rid of it. Um, that works. That just tells you that there are no, you can't go into a computer store and buy a Visual Basic two program. That doesn't mean that Visual Basic two programs aren't still being run out there. Um, the application compatibility team is working for. Future versions of Windows. There's additional uh, work that they're doing, like a team. If they want to remove a function, they they can. They they're not allowed to remove it yet, but they're allowed to put in sort of a, a, a tracker. So every time this function is called, a little a, a number is incremented, and then um, the you know Windows has this uh, was a customer experience program where you can voluntarily upload information to uh, to Microsoft about you know, un un not, you know anonymous information to Microsoft about how your computer is working and it you know it, it, it uploads information about hardware and 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 it will and the idea is that it will also upload these little tracker counters so it will say that oh you know the 10 million customers uploaded this information and you know 3,000 of them have hits on this function 
we we don't have those programs, but we know that there are 3,000 customers that if we had removed that function, their program would stop working. And so at least that gives us an idea of how how much pain it will be to remove the function. It's 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 a it's a very sensitive issue because if if you remove a function and it's like fine, you know, only 3,000 people will be affected by this, but 2,000 of them work at this very large corporation that buys millions of copies of Windows every year, um, you might want to keep that function around. Última pergunta. Mas alguém tem alguma pergunta? Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question about Windows Vista. Uh, it's no secret uh, that many people bash it. Mm -hmm. Many are leaving to Apple Mac and uh, Linux, etc. At Microsoft, do you see Windows Vista as a failure, or are you trying to improve it in any way you can? Are you already looking towards Windows 7? How are you dealing with it? Um, like me personally? Uh, the or what is the corporation doing? Uh, is exactly. Because I have no idea what the corporation is doing. I don't speak for Windows Corporation. I just do what I do. Um, do you? I mean, do you want me to give a PR answer? Uh, no, I just want you to uh, give some insights about what went wrong, if anything went wrong, uh, because it's seen as a worse product than XP. Uh, or what are you trying to do with it? Etc. Yeah, I, the, the Windows Vista Service Pack 1, I think, came out or recently came out. Has I know there have been uh, a number of significant improvements. Um, so work is still going at, on in, in improving Windows Windows Vista. Obviously, the most of the work is going into the next version of Windows. Um, but I'm really not at liberty to talk about what what sort of work is going on in in, in that in that respect. So. I, I don't want to be the one to, to you know, get quoted in the newspaper. <laughs> uh, this, this, I remember there was a, it was some conference. It was like a cryptography conference, and a reporter who was covering the cryptography conference talked to a Microsoft person who was giving a talk at the conference, and instead of talking about cryptogra cryptography, they asked them, "So, uh, when's the next version of Windows coming out?" And the person just said, well, I don't know, you know, it's like how many years were there between Windows 2000 and Windows XP? That was about like, you know, what, two, three years? And Windows XP to Windows Vista is about, what, like three, four, five years maybe? So maybe when next version of Windows, maybe three, four years, something like that. Yeah, it looks like that. Headline, newspaper, Microsoft announces Windows, next version of Windows available in 2010. <laughs> I'm not making it up. This actually happened. Um, So, you have to be very careful what you say. Queria que dessem uma salva de palmas ao Sr. Raymond Chen, por ter estado cá. Thank you very much. Agora, como eu queria agradecer primeiro que tudo ao, ao Sr. Raymond Chen pela, por ter a amabilidade de ter vindo cá a fazer esta conferência, a vocês por assistirem. E agora, como é habitual, vamos fazer os, alguns sorteios aqui na, na, nesta conferência. E temos para oferecer uh, nada mais, nada menos do que algumas lava lamps que ele teve a amabilidade de nos trazer. É um engenheiro 